morning we're going to be in John's Gospel in chapter 8. I would ask if uh, the crew could go ahead and display the text uh, right now so I could remind myself as to what the text is. Okay, I, I wanted to start back in verse 12. Okay, didn't realize I wanted to go that far back, but let's go ahead and do that. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12, and actually what I want us to focus on is um, verse 29, but I'm going to read through verse 30. Would you listen carefully as I read this because this is God's Word. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Then he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from below. Above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to Him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, What have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but He who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from Him, these I speak to the world." They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. As He spoke these things, many came to believe in Him. Now again, I just want to point out to you that our Lord Jesus reminds us that He was never alone, the Father was always with Him. The same is actually true of you, not in exactly the same sense, of course, because Jesus is unique, God in human flesh, the Son of Man, Son of God, but God is with you, the Father is with you, Jesus is with you, the Holy Spirit in particular is with you, He never leaves you alone. And of course, we're going to see that should make a remarkable difference in the way that you live because nothing that you do is done in secret. Everything you do is, is plain and open to the eyes of the Lord. And that can be good if you're loving Him and serving Him. It can be bad if you're not, but it can be good too even if you do something that is bad and you're the Lord's because He will be there to discipline you if you belong to Him. Now, we have been looking at what it means to know Jesus, and knowing Jesus, of course, among other things, means that you will want to do what Jesus did. You're going to want to follow His example because you have His Spirit living in you. You have His heart. You have His, his mind. You have His desires. Now, one thing that was clearly on the heart of the Lord was His desire to bring His lost sheep home. Well, if you have the heart of Christ, that desire is going to be in, on your heart as well and in your heart. You're going to want to see your family, 
You're going to want to see your friends. You're going to want to see your neighbors. You're going to want to see people you don't even know and people who are even your enemies. You're going to want to see them all come to Christ. But as we've also seen, there's going to be things that are going to get in your way. Certainly everything that Satan has to throw in front of you with regard to the world is constantly going to be diverting your heart and your affections, and that's going to stifle you as far as reaching others. But we have been looking at another obstacle, which is perhaps the greatest we have to face if we are sincerely desiring to serve the Lord, and that is fear, fear of being scorned being ridiculed, being abused by other people, maybe not physically or maybe, certainly verbally, of being thought foolish, of being called a religious fanatic, a fear of being out of step with your peers, you know, being odd, standing out. Well, your flesh is certainly going to capitalize on that fear and you're going to find yourself paralyzed. But you do need to realize because you have the Spirit of God living in you, you also have a resource. You have someone in you who is working to overcome your fears. And He does so in a variety of ways, as we've seen. He may give you a greater concern for the well-being of of others. You'll love them so much and care about them so much and you won't want them to perish so much that you'll break through all the things you're afraid of and you'll actually bring the gospel to them. Uh, The Spirit of God may give you, on the other hand, a greater confidence in God's promises. Perhaps He will boost your ability to obey Him. As we've been looking at in the evening, you can really only apprehend the promises of God if you know you're walking with the Lord. You have to walk with Him in obedience. Otherwise, you really won't have that confidence that the promises belong to you. And you won't be able to apply them as you should. So perhaps the Spirit of God will give you a greater boldness, a greater confidence by boosting your obedience. Or He may show you what we saw before more clearly, what an honor it is actually to stand in Christ's place and suffer for the one who loved you and suffered for you so that you could be saved. He may remind you that you're called to suffer I mean, Jesus said you can count on Him. You have to pick up your cross and follow after Him. That is the instrument of death. That's the instrument of suffering. It's the instrument of Christ's suffering. Jesus suffered to leave you an example that you should follow, that you would suffer as He suffered. Well, Jesus suffered. The disciples suffered. The early Christians suffered. The reformers suffered. They all suffered in their service for Him. And He says you need to count on that suffering. So he may remind you that's the status quo, that's what you signed up for. He may encourage you by reminding you that suffering is a mark that you belong to the Lord because it is the status quo, that it's a privilege to suffer in His place, that He will reward you for it. And of course, that through suffering, the Lord will make you grow stronger in Him because suffering is the way that the Lord actually you know, not only purifies us, but you might say tempers us like steel to make us stronger in the Lord. Well, there's many ways the Spirit can help, and there's many ways the Spirit does help. And this morning, we're going to consider another way in which He does that, and that is by reminding you or giving you faith to show you that God is with you, that He is always with you. If you know the Lord, the Spirit of God is in you, and if you have the Spirit of God in you, He is going to help you keep this truth before your eyes. So what I'd like to do this morning is consider, first of all, that God is with you. And then secondly, that the fact that that's true doesn't mean you're going to be able to draw from it what you need. You have to live in that reality by faith in order to gain the strength and the blessing that God actually intends through that. So first of all, let's consider that God is with you and the Bible tells us that He is with you in at least three ways. That He is all around you, that He is in you, and that He is for you. Now first of all, the Lord is all around you and what I mean by that is God is omnipresence. It means He's everywhere. 
You know, God is an infinite being, which means He has no boundaries or limits. He is unlimited in absolutely every way. And that includes with regard to space. He is everywhere. Uh, David writes regarding the Lord's presence in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, very familiar passage. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. David says there's no way to get away from the presence of God because it's everywhere. Paul, as he was speaking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill, said this in Acts 17, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist." Now, I know sometimes we get the impression from reading Scripture that God is in heaven and that's all, that's all He, well, the only place He is, that we have to look to heaven in order to direct our prayers toward God, although we do that for another reason, but that somehow He isn't here. Well, that isn't true. God is here. God is infinite. Now, He isn't here because He stretches Himself, as it were, infinitely thin through existence, but somehow God is present in every point of space with his entire being. As a matter of fact, Paul almost seems to indicate the space in which we live is the being and presence of God. I mean, you can't get away from space, right? That's why David couldn't get away from the presence of God because he's everywhere. Space is everywhere. Now, his presence isn't even limited by the things that he has made. I mean, we don't take up, as it were, you know, displace God. I mean, He's not only around you, He's not only over you and under you, He is also through you. (laughs) I mean, God is with you. He is absolutely present in every space. He is here. He's right before you, right before your eyes. Do you see Him? You can only see Him through the eyes of faith. The fact that God says He is here through His Word is enough to, to prove the point You simply need to believe it and see it. Now, the Lord, God is also with you in a second sense. He is in you. He lives in your soul by His Holy Spirit. I read to you in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what Paul wrote, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Now, there is a sense in which, again, all three persons of the, of the Godhead are everywhere present, and they permeate everything, and so the Spirit of God permeates everything as well, unbeliever and believer alike, but there is a certain uh, blessed sense in which the Spirit of God actually dwells within you and makes you the temple of God. He is present in you to work His graces. He is present in you to bless. He is present in you to mold you and shape you and to make you more like Jesus Christ. He is at work in you. You are His temple. You know, when God's Spirit raised you from the dead, and He did that spiritually, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ this morning, He did it by uniting Himself to your soul. So He now resides within you. He no longer lives in temples made with hands. But now in temples made without hands, He dwells in His people. He lives in you if you have trusted Him and are turning from your sins. You can know that He lives in you when you see the evidence of your life being transformed from within, becoming more like Jesus Christ without. So He is everywhere around you. He is in you, living in you as an active living principle. But He is also with you in another sense. He is with you to bless you. As you set your heart to obey the Lord, even as Jesus Christ did, which is what we've been looking at over the last couple of Lord's Day evenings, He is with you to bless you. 
That's really what Jesus meant when He said to His disciples as He sent them out with the Great Commission, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So as they would obey their Lord going out into all the world to make disciples, Jesus said He was going to be with them. He was going to be with them to watch over them. He was going to be with them to bless their work. He was going to be with them to accompany His gospel with power so that those who were His, He would bring into the fold. They would be quickened to life by the gospel so that they would listen and respond. Now again, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, which you can only know if you are obeying Him, He is with you. He is with you to help you in the work that He calls you to do for Him. So the Lord is all around you, the Lord is within you, and the Lord is present to bless you. Now, again, these, these things are true. You know, regardless of whether we accept them or not, they're true. Of course, if you're a believer, you have to accept them. You, you do accept them. You know they're true. But they're not going to help you the way that they should help you unless you actually live in the reality of these things. Again, that's where faith comes in. Faith is able to see the things that are invisible, the things that God has promised. You can see them. They have, you know, they have reality. They, they're, they're tangible. You might not be able to go to heaven right now, but you know it exists. You may not be able to see Jesus Christ right now, but you know that He is and you know that He did everything that He said He did. Well, you may not be able to see the presence of God either outside of you, permeating you, in you, as it were, the, by the Holy Spirit, or with you to bless. But He is, in fact, there, and you need to appropriate that, as David did. You need to set the Lord continually before you. You need to recognize that He is with you in every sense of the word. Now, if you're able to do this, and you can if you have the Spirit of God, but remember, it doesn't happen automatically. If you have the Spirit, He's going to be moving you that way, but you've got to cooperate with Him. You've got to agree. You've got to submit. You've got to do it. If you do, it can help you, as I've said, in a variety of ways. First of all, it can help you resist sin. Because if you take this seriously, you need to understand if God is present all around you and if He's in you, He sees you, doesn't He? He sees what you're doing. He sees the choices you're making, and He knows whether the choices that you're making, whether the thoughts you're thinking, the desires you have in your heart, whether they really honor Him or they dishonor Him. You know, just ask yourself this, this one question, when, when do your choices make the biggest difference to you? Have you ever been in a situation where you thought you were going to die, and thinking you were going to die, you, you thought, I might be standing before the Lord shortly? Isn't that when your choices really begin to make a difference? Because you may very shortly be standing before the Lord and having to give an account for what you've done. Well, it certainly does, has that effect on me. But you need to realize that God is present right now, and He sees, and He hears, and He knows. In that same psalm that I read a little bit earlier from David, talking about the fact that God's presence is everywhere, this is what he says with regard to the knowledge of God, even apart from His presence. But even if He didn't have His omniscience, He would still have His omnipresence and He would still know. But He has both. But David writes this, O Lord, You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. So God knows what you're doing. God sees what you're doing. He even knows it before you do it. So knowing that He sees what you're doing and that He actually knows it before you do, knowing that He is present in your soul and, by the way, is affected by what you do. I mean, why is it that when we sin, 
the Holy Spirit is grieved because He lives within us. We're His temple. We're misusing His temple. Now, the Spirit of God isn't weeping, as it were, but it, it's quenching Him. It's quenching His operation. It's affecting Him, although it isn't affecting His happiness, but it is affecting what He's doing within us. But knowing He is present in our souls and knowing it has this effect that it is possible to grieve Him can very, be very useful in helping you to obey the Lord. I mean, everything you do is open to Him. You can't do anything in secret. For God, any sin you commit is like doing it right in front of Him. Somebody said one time, it's like going before the throne of God in heaven and committing that act right in front of Him. And as a matter of fact, it is kind of like that, isn't it? Even though His throne isn't necessarily here, God is here. And He sees it just as clearly as if it were before His throne or anywhere else in the universe. You're doing it right in front of Him because He is present all around you. He is present within you. Now, if you are His, that means that He's going to be faithful to discipline you, to make sure that you avoid it the next time around, to make sure you don't continue going down that path because He loves you, so His presence with you is good. It can help restrain you and it can help correct you. Now, one thing we should think about too with regard to the presence of God, you can't do anything wrong in secret, but you also can't do anything right in secret either <laughs> that He's not going to see. That's good. Jesus says, you know, when He tells the Pharisees, don't do your acts of piety in public for people to applaud you, but rather do it in secret where only your Father sees. He says this, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He not only sees, of course, the sins we commit, but He also sees our acts of love and devotion to Him, and He will reward them. He sees everything. He sees everything you do for His glory, and no act of love is going to go unrewarded or overlooked. Now, again, I, I, this should have, I would think, in all of us, if we really believe it, a profound effect on what it is that you actually choose to do. Whether you choose to yield to the Spirit of God as He's seeking to help you love the Lord and obey the Lord and glorify Him, or to choose to yield to your fleshly desires and gratify your flesh. It should affect the choices we make. You need to learn to live in God's presence. We all need to learn this because He is present. And so we should behave as though He is. Now, the fact that He is with you can also be a comfort, of course, because He is present to help you, as Jesus told His disciples. Jesus was constantly aware of the fact that His Father was with Him as a great comfort, consolation, and strength to Him. John 8, 29, He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. Do you realize that even when you're alone, you're not alone because the Lord is with you. He sees you. He knows what you're going through. He knows your struggles. He knows your needs. And He is present to help you. I mean... Even when we're not aware of it, God is still there to help us. Have you ever been in a situation where something happened where it looked like your life was over? I mean, this is it. <laughs> you know, this is the end. Um, some of us have, maybe some of us haven't, but let's say for those of you who have, maybe you're in some kind of car accident. Um, when you're in those kinds of things, I mean, you consider what might have happened and you're alive and you're not dead and you think, you know, I was saved miraculously. Why? It's because the Lord was with you, because the Lord did what He said He was going to do. He will give His angels charge concerning you. They are ministering spirits sent out to render service to those who will inherit salvation. God was watching over you because He was present. Have you ever found yourself, any of you here, and actually we're going to answer this question because it's true of all of us, have any of you here ever gone without the necessities of life? Actually, if you had, you wouldn't be here, right? Right? The fact that you're here means you've never gone without the things you need to sustain your life. But why did you have them? 
It's because God is present with you to bless. Every good and perfect gift, James says, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Have you ever gone through circumstances that were so overwhelming, they, they seemingly were going to crush you, they were going to destroy you, and yet you weren't crushed, and you were wondering why? Why is my heart still beating? Why am I still, as it were, have any support at all? Well, it's because the Lord was with you to comfort you as He said that He would. He says, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. So God's presence can modify our behavior. It can make us do the right thing, it can make us, help us make the right choices. God's be, uh, presence with us, our Lord's presence with us, the Lord Jesus Christ can also comfort us because we're never alone. He's always present to bless. But the fact that He's with you can also give you courage, and courage is what we all need, especially in this particular age in which we live where it seems like it's becoming increasingly unpopular to be a Christian. Now, Moses and David set the Lord continually before them. They knew that God was with them, and so they weren't afraid. The author to the Hebrews, again, uh, in, from our meditation, talking about Moses, by faith, he left Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king who was going to send his armies after them to bring them all back. He did, wasn't afraid of that. For he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Did the presence of God give Moses courage? He uh, certainly did. I mean, he was willing to face the wrath of Pharaoh, at that time the most powerful man on earth, humanly speaking. David writes, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Not only would he stand firm, but I think also he wouldn't shake in his boots because he knew God was with him and would bless him. So like Moses, you don't have to be afraid. Like David, you don't have to be shaken. Like the disciples sent out by Jesus Christ, you can go out knowing that the Lord is going to be with you. Jesus said to His disciples as He was sending them out to preach the gospel in Israel, which was at that time the church of God, knowing that they would be a little bit intimidated by what was going on, not one bird falls to the ground apart from your father. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Jesus said, do not be afraid. You are more precious to God than many sparrows. The Lord actually says He's not going to allow anything to happen to you, that He will also not work together for your good, even though it includes suffering as we've seen, even though it includes the uncertainties of life, even though it includes persecution and a variety of other things. God is going to work it all together for good so we can have courage, we can have comfort, and we can have accountability, you might say, from these things. Now again, in closing, let me just say this. Don't forget that, that this is only going to help you practically if you actually are able to see it, you see. It's only going to help you overcome sin. It's only going to encourage you to obey the Lord. It's only going to comfort you and give you courage if you're aware of it. I mean, how often do you go through the day completely oblivious to the fact that God even exists, not to mention the fact that He's with you? And how many times have you forgotten His presence and you've made sinful choices and then you've kind of remembered after you've committed the sin and then you were ashamed? Why wasn't I aware? Why didn't I see myself living in the sight of God? Why did I not do what Paul tells me to do in all my choices? To, to do what I do for the glory of God. Why did I do this thing? Now God has seen it. God knows. He knew I was going to do it ahead of time. But why do we do that? Why do sometimes do we live as practical atheists? It's because we're not doing what David did or what, what Jesus did. We're not living in the knowledge that God exists and that He is with us, and we need to do that. How many times have you felt like the situation that you were in was a hopeless situation because you forgot that God is with you to bless you, to keep you as He promised He was going to keep you and to bring good things out of the difficult circumstances? How many times you've been afraid to tell other people about Jesus Christ because you forgot the Lord was with you? 
and that whatever this person did, he wasn't ultimately going to be able to harm you, but again, God was going to work it all together for your good and that he might even by his grace bring this poor soul who would otherwise suffer for an eternity in hell savingly to Christ. You see, you need to set the Lord continually before you. You need to live your life in the sight of God, knowing that He is with you and that because He is, that you will prosper, that God will bless you. Now, I mentioned before that the presence of God is true for everyone, isn't it? You know, it's, it's not true that He's present just here among believers. I mean, He's present with the unbelievers that are out there, and He's also present with the unbelievers who are in here. And you need to realize that the presence of God means something a bit different for you if you're an unbeliever than it does for those who are believers. You see, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, if you don't obey the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to remember that God is present, that God knows what you're thinking. God knows what you're doing. He sees what you're doing. He knows why you do what you do, even when you do the things that are right. He knows that even those things you do for some other reason than that you love Him. He knows why you do all that you do. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. And the Bible says that one day He's going to bring absolutely everything that you've done, even every idle word that you've spoken, every coarse word, every filthy word, every filthy idea, Everything you've done contrary to the will of God, every single thing He's going to bring in judgment against you because He has seen it all. He was a witness. He sees everything. And of course, being a just God, He can't overlook sin. And every single one of those sins, He is going to weigh in the balances and it's going to weigh you down into hell. You need to remember that God sees, God knows, and God is just, that God is going to bring it into account. But you also need to remember what the Lord makes very plain in Scripture, that He is also merciful, He is also forgiving to all who will turn away from those sins and will turn to His Son and trust in His Son to save them from their sins. Now, the Lord is present. He's present now. And so you can call on Him now. You can ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins. You can ask the Lord to change your heart. You can ask the Lord for the grace that you need. He's not a God who is far off. He is near. Ask Him for the grace you need to trust Jesus Christ and to turn from your sins that you might know His forgiveness and that you might know these blessings that we've been talking about. Turn to the Lord. Don't just content yourself in the fact that you think you know Him. You need to know that you know Him. Don't be content with anything else than the fact that Jesus Christ is being formed in you. If you don't love Jesus Christ, if you're not following Him, you haven't trusted Him. You don't believe in Him. You're not saved. You need to trust the Lord. You need to turn from your sins. You need to follow Him. Yes, there's times when even true believers go through dark times and difficult times, and we all struggle. But the heart of a true Christian is he loves the Lord. He wants to overcome that sin. He wants to obey and follow Christ. He wants to be like Christ, and he wants to glorify Christ. His heart is not for the world, but his heart is for Jesus. So examine your heart and see where you're at, and then respond accordingly. Trust in the Lord that you might be saved. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply this word to our hearts this morning.